Hi, welcome to the newest installment of The Benefits of Being an Octopus by Anne Braden. We're picking up on page 163 in chapter 19. Okay, Google, set a timer for 15 minutes. Okay, Google, set a timer for 15 minutes. 15 minutes, and that's starting now. When I get... We already read that page. She drops the menus back onto the hostess stand. You've only got three minutes. I know. As soon as we're both in the bathroom, she pulls the door shut behind us. Ricky has never been much of a decorator, but there is one black and white photo of a funny looking car on the wall. Maybe it's supposed to be an Italian car. I'm not sure. Okay, so I stammer. Who thought this was a good idea? Maybe I can make up something different to tell her. I finger the folded up form in my pocket. No, this is about not letting people mess with you. Maybe it's about to be awkward, but Ms. Rochambeau would probably just tell me to suck it up. You know that hole in the wall over the washing machine? I start. You can see into your bedroom through it. Are you serious, Zoe? This is what you need to tell me? My mom starts fixing her makeup in the mirror. And I saw the way Lenny blamed you that night we lost power. And you've been sp Spying on us? I take a deep breath. And how he keeps doing it. Blaming you for every... That is none of your business, my mom snaps. And of all people, you know how lucky we are to get to live with him. It's not like he hits me. We are lucky. But the way he treats you, mom... She bares her teeth to the mirror and wipes a smudge of pink lipstick off one of them. He just gets frustrated sometimes. He's allowed to get frustrated like anyone. He doesn't have to take it out on you. She shrugs. Well, when it's my fault, it makes sense. Except when it isn't, except when it isn't. I pull, up, pull out the form from my pocket and hand it to her. She unfolds it and stares at it. How do you have this? He had it, mom. He had it all along. He never turned it in like he said he did. My mom looks up at me and her eyes are like firebolts. I'm ready for this. I'm ready for her to be furious with him. I'm ready for her. I'm ready to hug her and tell her that I love her and that I'm so sorry she's having to live with this. How dare you, she says. Me? How dare me? How dare you give this to me? What are you trying to do? Stir up trouble? What? I sputter. No, I'm not trying to make trouble. I just wanted you to know the truth. Her eyes widen, and I hardly see her hand slicing through the air before the slap lands on my cheek, hard, angry, and stinging. You want the truth? She snarls as she rips up the form and hurls it into the trash. Here's the truth. If I catch you spying on us ever again, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. She pulls open the bathroom door and storms out. I sink down onto the toilet, alone. Thursdays are my mom's short shift because it's trivia night at the pizza pit and Ricky likes to work the floor himself on those nights. My mom doesn't look at me when she gets home though, just bustles right into the kitchen, pulls out a box of spaghetti and puts water on to boil. You home, mommy, Aurora squeals and runs over to hug her. We gonna have spaghetti? My mom leans down to hug Aurora. We sure are, she nods to Bryce who's skulking up behind them like he wants to hug her, but doesn't think he should. How was your day at school, Bryce? She asks. He shrugs. Okay. Once the pot is on the stove, she pulls out the stuff to make Hector's formula. She still doesn't look at me. I pick up Hector out of his seat and plop down on the couch with him, like all I want to do is hold him and watch TV with Frank. No big deal, right? What did I expect her to do when I confronted her? Just instantly go back to the determined, fearless mama bear she was when I was eight? Maybe she, was ne maybe she was never that different from how she is now. Maybe I was just too young to know better. Frank is watching the lost secrets of the War of 1812, but even though the volume is up, I can still hear Aurora helping my mom in the kitchen, like they're a totally normal family. Are we going to have spaghetti sauce, too? Can I tur it? Oh, yum. Are those meatballs? What's that out the window? I peek over and see Aurora hopping up and down at my mom's feet. Bryce is slouching by the refrigerator, playing with the can opener. 
My mom peers out the window over the sink. Oh, you're right, Aurora. A bird just flew by. One of those little chickadee birds. Chickadee dee 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 dee, Aurora screams, flapping her arms like wings. My little chickadee, my mom laughs, patting Aurora on the head. Of all times for Frank to turn up the TV to drown them out, couldn't this be it? I hear the door and then Lenny's voice. It sure is good to smell dinner cooking when you get home. Lenny walks in, his perfectly shaved cheeks practically shining. How was your day? My mom asks him. She has a smile on like Lenny had a normal day and not a first day of being partially unemployed. Lenny stretches. Pretty good. Filled out some applications. No bites yet, but I'll keep trying. I just know there's going to be someone who can't wait to hire you. My mom leans up against the sink and peers out the window. Oh, the chickadee is back. It's got its feathers all puffed out like a big puffy coat. It's so cute. No one cares about some bird, so settle down, Lenny says, and the pasta is boiling over. Oh, my mom exclaims, reaching to, sh to switch off the burner and uncover the pot as the water comes streaming down the sides. Lenny shakes his head and tosses her the roll of paper towels. Make sure you get all that junk out from under the burner. I'm gonna go take a shower. My mom might be scurrying around in a paper towel tizzy, trying to clean up all the boiling hot water, but Bryce is like a statue as he watches Lenny head into the bathroom. Even after Lenny closes the door behind him, Bryce still doesn't move. I put Hector on my hip and quietly approach Bryce. I put my free arm around him. Come on, I whisper. Let's see if we can get Hector to giggle. But Bryce just shakes his head, slips out from under my arm, and goes back to fiddling with the can opener. Zoe, look, Aurora calls. I'm turning the paquetti. I take a deep breath. Bryce is hunched over the can opener, spinning it and spinning it and spinning it. Zoe, Aurora calls again. You have to come see. I nod. I'm coming. 20 minutes later, the stove has been perfectly cleaned and my mom is pouring milk into cups for the kids. I put Hector back into his seat and I am preparing, separating the meatballs from the sauce on Aurora's plate because she doesn't like them touching. When Lenny reemerges from the bathroom, he's stroking his cheek like he might have just shaved for the second time today. Like a perfectly shaven cheek is how you get into some kind of perfect heaven. And like he's on, and like he's on his way there, happily dragging my mom behind him by her hair. She chose him over me him and his perfectly shaved cheek. I want to tackle him. I want to knock him down. I straighten up and face him. I join the debate club at school. The words come out of my mouth before I can stop them. And of course, I don't even know if I'm in the club anymore since I just walked out. But if there was a debate club where you got to debate Lenny, I'd be all over it. He smirks and shakes his head. Right. I did, I say. He's about to pull the fridge open, but he stops and looks at me like I'm some little girl hiding an ice cream cone behind my back. You really expect me to believe that? I'm not going to let him throw me off. The teacher in charge of the club is even giving me a ride home so I can pick up Bryce and Aurora on time. Yeah, I know that's what you told your mom, but I'm not as gullible as she is. He raises his eyebrows at me like we're sharing some special secret. I know you and your little friends just want more time to get into stuff you shouldn't be getting into. How can you, you can argue all you want, little lady, he says, opening the fridge and grabbing his can of soda, but it's only going to prove you're trying to make trouble. I open my mouth, but no words come out. I catch my mom watching. Her face looks gray. Aurora tugs at my shirt. Is my spaghetti ready? I'm hungry. I nod and slide her plate off the counter so she can bring it with her to the couch. It's 20 minutes later when we're watching the local news that I realize what should have come out of my mouth. You know that you're just trying to discredit your opponent. I learned that at debate club, except that it didn't. There are so many reasons why I don't belong in debate club. Later that evening, after getting Hector to sleep, my mom and Lenny have gone out to the pool hall to see some of Lenny's friends. Bryce and Aurora are zoned out in front of the TV. All right, come on guys, I call. It's time to get ready for bed. Neither of them say anything in response or even move. Frank's currently watching one of those political analysis shows, so there's no way they're really paying attention to it. I put down the dish I've been watching and walk behind the couch to lean over right between their heads. Bryce and Aurora, it's time to get up and get ready for bed. 
Bryce glances at me and then looks back at the TV. No one cares about listening to you, so settle down. I freeze. Maybe it's Bryce sitting there, but it's Lenny's words coming out of his mouth. I'm sitting next to him in an instant. Don't you dare start saying what Lenny says, I whisper. He glares at me. What's wrong with it? Because Lenny's not being nice when he says things like that, I hiss. Don't be like that. Bryce crosses his arms and his voice comes out loud enough to shake the whole trailer. I will be if I want to be. Stop yelling, Aurora says. You too loud. I'm not yelling, he screams. Aurora stamps her foot. Yes, you are. Both of you need to shut up, erupts Mount Frank from his recliner. Bryce and Aurora immediately burst into tears and make a break for the bedroom, wailing. When I come through the door after them, Bryce has turned to Aurora. You don't know anything, he snaps at her through his tears. You know less than nothing. You're just a stupid bug that keeps annoying everyone around you, and no one cares about you. Bryce, Albro, I cry, what's the matter with you? They fight all the time, but it's about who gets to play with what toy or who accidentally pushed whom. It's never flat out mean. Aurora's tears keep flowing but it's a silent kind of crying now. She's almost trembling as she stares at her older brother. I kneel down to be face to face with her. It's not true what he said. I wipe a tear from her cheek. You need to know it's not true. She lets me pick her up and burrows her head into my shoulder. Bryce, I say, never speak to someone that way ever again, especially someone that you love. You are not a mean person and I'm not going to stand by and let you become one. Except, what can I actually do? When you're living in a pond of algae, you turn green. It doesn't matter how often someone tells you to stop. Chapter 20. When I finally gotten Bryce and Aurora into bed, but not yet to sleep, I hear Frank's gruff voice from the living room over the noise of the TV. Someone's here for you. He never calls me by name. I'm not actually sure that he knows my name, but who else could he be talking to? I poke my head out of the bedroom. What's going on? I hear Bryce call from bed. You were going to tell us a Tory, Aurora says. I don't see anyone at first, just Frank flopping back into his recliner with a grumble. And then peeking around the corner of, with the washing machine, I see part of a face and a bit of pink hair. Fuchsia? I'll tell you a story in just a bit, I call back over my shoulder. I promise. I quickly close the door to the bedroom behind me, cross the main room, and come around the corner to the entranceway. What are you doing here? She shakes her head. She's wearing her jacket, which might be pink, but was clearly designed for winter in Florida, and she looks completely frozen. Here, I grab my jacket from the pile of coats. Put this on. Warm yourself up. She slides down until she's sitting on the floor with her back to the washing machine and my jacket over her like a blanket. Her teeth are chattering. I sit down across from her in the entryway, scooting Bryce's snow boots out of the way. Fuchsia takes her hands out of her pockets and re reveals an inhaler clutched in her fist. She takes two shots of it and then leans back against the washing machine. I just feel like I'm going to explode or something. What, because of the inhaler? Isn't it supposed to help? The doctor said I should use it whenever I feel like my chest is tightening up, but that's like all the time right now, and the inhaler isn't making it go away. You should go to the hospital then. I tug at her wrist. Why are you here? Fuchsia closes her eyes and bows her head. Because nothing is going to get better unless I tell someone, she whispers. What is she talking about? I couldn't tell you at school. Her voice is so quiet I can barely hear her. You never know when a teacher is going to overhear you, and I've learned my lesson about that. Why does she have to be so dramatic? I'm about to stand up and tell her that I'm done, that I'm done with her and all of her games, just done. But then she starts talking. I threatened Crystal that I would call DCF if she made me move in with Michael. And then, I guess, Crystal told Michael because the next day, he showed up to pick me up from school instead of my mom. And as soon as I got into his car, he told me that if I ever pull something like that again, then I wouldn't live to... Her voice cracks. Oh my gosh. My hand flies to my mouth. Did he... Was he the one in the parking lot who 
She squeezes her eyes shut. I thought he was going to kill me. He was pointing the gun right at me before he shifted to the side and shot through the window of the car instead. That sound of glass shattering, I can hear it so perfectly. He fired twice more just for fun. And then, like nothing had happened, he drove us out of the parking lot. Like nothing had happened. It was the day after that when Fuchsia kept going on and on about her asthma and about how she couldn't breathe. And I was getting annoyed with her. And we'll have to see what happens next, next week. Join us then.